monies so that they can pick it up. This money goes to the Worthy Children's Fund at Carmen Adventist School. And Ashley Wade is going to do the children's story. It's like she's going to do some cooking. Good morning. Good morning. You guys awake? Well, I'm glad someone's awake. How many of you like to eat cake? Oh, not that many. Oh, now I see more hands. I definitely enjoy eating cake probably too much. For some reason this week, I have baked way too much. Um, why do you like cake? Can anyone tell me why you like cake? Because there's so much sugar inside. I'm glad you're honest, because it does have a lot of sugar in it. Anybody else? Okay. Because I like cake. You like cake. I'm glad. I'm glad you like cake. Um, does anyone know what goes into making a cake? Eggs. Eggs. Anyone else? Flour. Flour. Milk. Milk. Any others that you can think of? Baking powder. Baking powder. Awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm glad that you knew that ingredient. Then all these things must taste good, right? What do you think? Would you ever consider eating the ingredients separate by themselves? You think I should eat some of this flour? You think it would taste good? What about these eggs? I would, it probably wouldn't taste that good. I think some people might eat them, though. Um, so, we know that each of them would all taste pretty gross. But what about sugar? You think sugar tastes gross by itself? I think some of you would eat some of the sugar if I gave it to you right now. I'm sure. <laughs> um, you know, life can be a lot like cake. Separately, it can be bitter sometimes, um, it can be hurtful sometimes, it can be dry and bland. Um, you know, there's some, sometimes not, there's not so good things that happen in our lives. Uh, maybe falling down at the playground and scraping yourself. Maybe not listening to your parents or your teacher. Uh, but there's some good times, you know. Celebrating your birthday, going on vacation, having fun uh, at home. Um, and some of the cake ingredients by themselves, like we said, don't taste good. But when we mix everything together, we have a delicious cake. And so just like that, God is able to blend the good and bad experiences in our life for good. Um, all together, they create a life that it's meaningful, useful, and tasty. So if I were to put all these ingredients together, you, and mix them up, oop, my butter got hard. That's okay. Oops. And I mix them all up, and if I was to put them in the, put this in the oven, what do you think is going to come out? A cake. And so I have the end result here as a 
cake. And so I want you to remember this promise that God gives us in Romans 8.28. It goes, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. The Bible is full of great examples of this. Um, for example, Joseph, if he hadn't been sold into slavery, he may have not later been in the position to save his family. Esther, at her time, was used to save the Hebrew people. Uh, so with those examples, I want you to remember from this cake lesson that all, even though some of these things were bland and dry and not so good by themselves together, they, the end result was something good. Would someone like to pray for us this morning? Dear Jesus, we love you. Thank you for this wonderful church. We love you. Amen. All right, it is time for our offering. Two men were marooned on an island. One man paced back and forth, worried and scared, while the other man sat back, sunning himself. The first man said to the second man, aren't you scared we're going to die? No, said the second man, I make $100,000 a week, and I tithe and give my offering faithfully each week at church, my pastor will find me. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how much we make. We got to remember it's always God's money. Um, and we are called to give it back. And he only asks for 10%. And that's better than what the government asks. Will the deacons please stand? Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to give to our church and to give back to you. We pray that you will bless this offering and bless the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
sing with us, please. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, His righteousness. Amen. I dare not trust the sweetest rains, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone.
Amen. If you're able, please kneel with me or bow your heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, blessed be your name. Thank you so much for your gifts and blessings on our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives. Let us walk upon the waters wherever you may call us. I pray that we may hear your calls, that we may act on the Holy Spirit that you will guide us, that you will navigate us through the waves, through the waters of life. That, will you take, that you will take us to the shore, that we may walk a straight path. Guide our feet. We may see your light. We pray for your guidance in all that we do. Guidance this Sabbath, that we may hear the message, that it may speak to us, speak to our hearts. We pray for your guidance this week, at work, at home. Pray for your Holy Spirit, that it showers us with comfort in our time of need, in our time of challenge, in our time of questions. Pray that we may find you through the scriptures, that we may be able to carve out, carve out more time in our day for you in prayer, in thought, in the scriptures, in reading, glorify you. I pray that we may carve out more time for our friends, for our family, that we may minister to others the joy and the wonder of your salvation. We pray for this congregation <clears throat> that we may hear your word. Pray for Pastor Matt as he delivers your message. Pray for people who are in need or hurt and who need help. Bless those who do not have homes, jobs, food or water, or friends or family. We pray for Dobbs family, the recent passing of Sylvia. Pray for Varia Becker and her health, and Carol Kemp during her recovery. Blessed be your name, blessed be your face, blessed be your spirit, blessed be Jesus Christ. Amen.
heart is beating, beating inside my chest. Oh, and I'm coming alive with joy and destiny. bad when you hear a song twice in one day and you cry both times, you know? <laughs> Thanks, Heather. It's good to be back. It's been, I feel like I've been gone a bunch. Last week we were at camp meeting. The week before that, uh, I was at a baptism at the Brazilian church. It's been kind of here, t- touch and go every, uh, every other week for a while. Next week, Pastor Luke and I are both gone. Uh, Pastor Luke's down in Oglethorpe. He's going to be preaching at that church, and uh, it's a neat opportunity. I'm glad he gets to go. And I'm going to be on a family reunion, so I'm gone again next Sabbath. But the blessing that we have in our church is the incredible elders that uh, have talents in speaking. And uh, I know that last week I heard, I heard at least 15 times, David, that, uh, that I've got great competition, that David's a fantastic preacher, right? Man. Uh, I, I know David has mission just oozing through his veins. Um, that's, that's why I wanted you as an elder, man, because you lead the church like that. And thanks for sharing your, your, your life and your story and sharing the mission in your heart. That's awesome. Thanks, man. Next Sabbath, Pastor Wilma is going to be preaching. And I know she has uh, the same mission in her veins as well. So uh, be looking forward to that. But I want to invite you a special specific invitation to June 23. That's not today. It's not next Sabbath. It's the week after that. Do not miss that week. Uh, that doesn't mean the next week's not important, but it's June 23 that I have a surprise for you that I think will blow your mind on the way that we think about ministry here at Mac, and uh, I hope that you're able to come. We have a Compassion Sabbath, and as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about Stephanie. Can I call you up right now, Stephanie? Come on. I was supposed to do this in the announcements, but I'm taking this moment right now. Uh, June 23 is our Compassion Sabbath. So after this big surprise uh, that I'm, I'm teasing you with, it's just a teaser, 
We're going to uh, go out after church, and we're going to do something kind of cool. Miss Stephanie, do you, uh, I don't know, does the church know you? Let's try this. Stephanie Heath Nash is our newest teacher at Carmen Avenue School starting next year, um, and you're going to be the kindergarten teacher. Yep, um, taking Miss Wade's place, which sad to see you go. I'm glad that you're here to step in and fill the gap. June 23, we have Compassion Sabbath, where we share God's love in a practical way. And I'm going to use this mic, and I'm going to share it with her, okay? So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to do welcome wagon baskets to, to new people that have moved into our community. There are services out there where you can, um, this, is, this sounds like we're stocking people. It's not like that. It's, it's totally legit. It's for ministry purposes only. You can pay 20 bucks, and this service will give you the last 50 people or whatever, however many moved in the last uh, such, such a time for a zip code. And so we know who they are. We know where they live. And so what are we going to do, Stephanie? I'm just going to pass this to you. Don't feel like you get it. I'll hold it for you. How's that? Thank you. Okay, we're going to be making welcome wagon baskets for them that welcome them to our community and kind of are a relational evangelism type thing that will allow us to make contact with them in a non-threatening way that will welcome them and give them an opportunity to know that we're here, give them our website, let them check us out, and hopefully... Um, we'll be praying for this ahead of time so that God can prepare their hearts and minds so they can be ready for the contact that we're about to make with them. People moving to the community need community. They need friends. They need a place to, to connect. And so this is a simple way to say, hey, welcome. We're glad you're here. And we'd love to be a, a church family for you as well. Um, so in these baskets, I've seen some ideas that you had. They're great ideas. Um, but there may be some ways that we as a congregation can collect things, bring things, bake things, whatever it is. What are some of these things that we can help make this happen? So for a more traditional kind of welcome to the neighborhood thing, it's, you know, a, a little baked good kind of thing, a candle, maybe some cleaning things, a little gift certificate to Lowe's or something. You know, you've moved recently, you know what this is like. So it's just an opportunity for us to give them something, and every time they use it, they're going to remember who gave it to them. And that's kind of something that, you know, it's low-key, it's chill, but it definitely remind they'll know that Mac was there and that we are someone who wants to welcome them to the community. So um, if you contact the office, they can give you my email address. And you can contact me if you're interested in donating something for it ahead of time. If you don't have time for that on Compassion Sabbath, we're going to be putting the baskets together and then distributing them. You can participate that way. And if you can't be here for that, then you can be praying for these 30 families that we're going to try to impact positively. Awesome. Thanks, Stephanie. You're awesome. So uh, just, yeah, thanks. Some of those specifics she was saying were baked goods. I know some of you are really great bakers. I don't know if that's cookies or cakes or pies. Make sure you use baking soda or whatever. I was impressed. My son knew what that was. That's cool. Um, candles. Um, those gift cards. Are, I mean, we're thinking like $10 gift cards to Home Depot. Whatever. If you feel impressed to do that, do that. We're going to pray, and then we're getting into the message. Too many advertisements, so let's pray. God, thank you for guiding us through this, uh, this, just this short time that we have together, and I pray that you'll speak loudly and clearly straight to our hearts and convict us where we need to be convicted and urge us and challenge us where we need to be challenged. And I pray that in your name. Amen. Just over a month ago, I was in Arizona, Holbrook, Arizona, with nine other MAC members as we went on a mission trip to Holbrook Indian Mission School. It's a cool little school out in the middle of nowhere. Home Depot is an hour and a half away. It's in the boonies. Uh, they, all they have is like sand and tumbleweed rolling around. But there are 80-some uh, Native American children that have essentially escaped from their homes and the, the, the junk that they live, and they live at this dormitory, at this school, at Holbrook Indian Mission School. And we got to spend a good time there, about a, almost a week. Uh, in the day, we would paint some of the staff houses that were in terrible disrepair. We had to uh, scrape all the old paint off and then paint them nicely. In the evenings, we did VBS and week of prayer. Now these kids, they come from homes that are just a disaster. And as we walked into the cafeteria that first morning, we saw them and they saw us and it was very awkward because there was no, hey, or welcome, just blank stares at us. Like, who are these strangers coming into our campus that we don't know and they don't know us? Uh, there was no warm welcome, and so uh, the, all of us, the, the ten of us, thought, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to sit with them, or are we just going to sit by ourselves? So we sat by ourselves. Uh, you know, missionaries, let's sit by ourselves. Some of us branched out a little bit. But soon enough, there were some kids that came over and, and met us. Two girls came over to my table, and I said, hey, what's your name? Uh, these 
think about these kids. They don't trust anybody. So who are these new guys that come in here? Like, I'm not going to trust you. Hey, what's your name? And the girl said, nothing. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, oh, that's a great name. That's a new name. I've never heard that before. Good to meet you. Nothing. And she giggled and smiled. And the girl next to her, I said, well, tell me your name. And she said, nothing. And I said, well, this is great. Easy to remember. Nothing one and nothing two. And so all week long, I called them this. And they thought it was fun and giggled and whatnot. There was another kid that walked around, um, and he wore the same thing every single day. It was a LeBron James jersey. Kind of uh, ironic that I have LeBron in my sermon today. We should pray for that man right now. <laughs> Poor guy. Greatest player in the world, though. Don't forget that. I sure I'll get a few emails. I better keep going here. LeBron James jersey. And uh, I, do, I don't even know this kid's name, but I often, every time I saw him, I'd be like, Hey, what's up, LeBron? And he loved it. He just thought it was so cool. On Friday night, as we were closing down week of prayer, Pastor Luke has already preached. Um, we've already done songs. We've already done the small groups. And it's time to say goodbye to these, these kids. And so, uh, you know, we're giving hugs. And some of the kids were closer to certain ones. And we're, you know, just kind of connecting with whoever it is. And this, this kid, LeBron, he comes up to me and he hands me something. And I brought it with me today. Here's what it is. Isn't that cool? I mean, not that it's LeBron's jersey, but it's cool that he gave me his jersey. And, I, and like he, he starts, he, he takes it off, and he hands it to me, and instantly I'm like, I'm not taking this kid's jersey. Like, he comes from a home where there's no money, there's no way he's going to be able to buy a new jersey. Uh, this, he wears this every day, it's his favorite thing in the world, there's no way I'm taking this guy's jersey. And as I'm thinking about it, I'm, I'm also thinking about uh, why he would give me my jersey, and it comes from football. Not that one. This one. Soccer, as some of you may know it. Back in 1931, a French team and an English team came together. They're playing. The French team is the underdog team, and the French team wins. And at the end of the game, one of the players goes to the other team, to one of his the, the, the opponents, and he says, I want your jersey as a sign of respect and honor for the opponents that we played. I want to have this as a memento uh, so that I can honor you that I always have your jersey. I want to give you my honor by taking your jersey. The, the opponent said, well, I would like to do that too. You give me honor, I want to give you honor. Let's reciprocate honor here. You give me honor, I'm giving it right back to you. And so this tradition of exchanging jersey has gone all over the place. Now they do it in, uh, well, here's, here's uh, Beckham trading jerseys. They do it in, the, in NFL too now, the American football. It happens all over the place. Exchanging journeys. You honor me and I will honor you. It's reciprocating honor. And I'm standing there in the boys' dorm chapel as this LeBron has given me his jersey, and I'm understanding what's happening, and I'm thinking, this means i got to give him my shirt. <laughs> and I was ready and prepared to just rip that shirt off, whatever, and give it to him, except the shirt I was wearing was the shirt that we had just bought. It was our, our mission trip group shirt that we just bought at the campus store that every kid on campus had. It was nothing special. Every kid had 10 of them. It's at Holbrook Indian Mission School. And I, and I mean, I was kind of like, do, I, do, you want, do you want this one? So I ended up just giving him a hug and telling him my respect and how I honor him as well. Reciprocating honor. See, too often, our focus in life gets fractured and divided among so many different distractions, and you know all these distractions well. Your jobs, your careers, your, your drive to succeed. Anybody? I know you're out there because I have it too. Uh, your desire to be connected to friends that really care. How about this one? Your deep-seated desire to matter, to have value in life. Your quest for happiness. And none of these are bad, they're all good, but so often uh, our focus is, is fractured to so many different places when I really believe that the only true priority goal in our life should be simply to honor God. I mean, that's, that's just simply put, when honoring God becomes our goal in life, everything else falls into its rightful place as a secondary goal. 
When honoring God becomes our goal in life, everything else falls into its rightful place as a secondary goal. And it makes everything so much simpler when honoring God is the the paramount desire in your life. Choices, decisions, everything becomes simple because you ask the question, does this honor God? And if it does, you do it. And if it doesn't, you don't. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2. I'm just going to let LeBron hang out here on the floor. 1 Samuel chapter 2, where we see our story today. And I'll give you context. You've got to have the context, otherwise it won't make sense. It's really a giant story, and uh, we're just going to start here at the beginning. It's First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings are some of the greatest books in the Bible, I think. The stories are just rich, and they're easy to understand, and they're, it's just real life stuff. And in 1 Samuel, it starts off with two people that have very similar names, Hannah and Elkanah, husband and wife, Hannah and Elkanah. And uh, it, husband and wife, now there's an interesting piece to their marriage because there's a third party. Her name is Penina. Two wives for one man, never a good idea, and you can see it in this story as well. Uh, well several times, once a year, uh, the, the, group, the, the three of them, Elkanah, Hannah, and Penina, and children, Penina's kids, would go to Shiloh to worship together. And when they would get to Shiloh, they would have sacrifices, there would be meat somehow in the picture, and so Elkanah would give meat to Penina and her kids, but he would give a double portion to Hannah, almost like he loved her more. Well, Penina doesn't like this, and I get this, there's just drama here, and so she begins to throw shade and criticize and and embarrass and uh, just, just be nasty to Hannah because Hannah can't have kids. And so Hannah's life is a life of misery because she can't provide a son for her husband. And so at one point where they're at Shiloh, Hannah is there at the temple, the, the sanctuary, and she's, she's crying out to God. She's, I, I imagine her bent over, maybe kneeling down. Her eyes are closed, and she's praying her heart out. And uh, her eyes are closed. Her lips are murmuring the, the words that she's saying to God. And Eli, the priest, he's standing over at the side, and he looks at her, and he thinks, She's drunk! And so he goes over and talks to her, and they have this conversation, and she says, Oh, no, no, I'm not drunk. I'm just heartbroken because I can't have kids, and and my request to God is that I can have a child to to please my my husband and to continue the lineage and this and that. And so Eli, probably a little bit embarrassed, but also sensing God's leading in this, he says to her, he gives her a blessing that she will have a child. She goes home, she becomes pregnant, and Elkanah and Hannah have a little boy named Samuel. A little boy with a big story. After Samuel is weaned, Hannah and Elkanah take Samuel to, the, uh, the, to Eli, the priest. Because she's made a vow to God that if she has a, a child, she will give him into service to, ki- to, to God, to, to, to the ministry. So she takes him to Eli, and in verse Chapter 1, verse 28, here's what it says. I got it on the screen for it. This is what Hannah says. She says, I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord. Hannah then has a prayer in chapter 2, a song, if you will, as she's praying and thanking God. And then in chapter 2, verse 11, here's what it says on the screen. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest's priest. So Eli goes into the ministry. I'm sorry, Samuel goes into the ministry under Eli. And the very next sentence in the Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, we're introduced to two punks. Verse 12 says this, Eli's sons were scoundrels. That's what my Bible says. I don't know what yours says. What does yours say? Somebody. Wicked men. That's the only one I heard. Yeah, Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. So we have this contrasting picture of Samuel, and we'll get more into his story, and you've got the two sons. In fact, these two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, you don't ever hear those names. No Americans use those names, and you wouldn't want to be known as Hophni and Phinehas because these guys lacked one thing, and that was a desire to honor God with their life. And because they had no desire to honor him, They lived lives that were incredibly disrespectful and dishonoring to God. Here's what they were doing. Two major things. You can read it in the passage here. I'll just tell it to you. Um, So they're priests, right? Eli's the high priest. They're the son priests, and they're serving. 
and people would come with their offerings, their sacrifice, and the animal would, would be killed. Then this family would take their animal back and they would boil it. Well, there's parts of the animals that were for the priests and parts that were for the family and parts that were for the Lord. Very specific pieces. The Lord's parts were the fatty parts. So these priests, Hophni and Phinehas, they would make note of the family that comes to give their offering, and they would send their helpers to the family's home, and as the family's boiling this, this meat, they would take this three-pronged fork and plunge it down into the pot and pull up whatever meat it grabbed. It, they weren't, ir, uh, they weren't uh, specific about what kind of meat it was. If it was the fatty part that belonged to God, they didn't care. If it was their part, great. If it was somebody else's part, fine. But they essentially were disrespecting God by saying, you don't really matter. I'm just going to take whatever comes my way. I don't really care. And so they would take that. They would eat it. Here's the other part. Uh, the, these two priests, these two men, Hophni and Phinehas, supposed to be shining examples of who God is, and yet they were sleeping with the girls that also served there uh, around the temple. And I think that there's got to be some sort of spiritual coercion happening I don't think these girls just instantly said, yeah, yes, yes, let's go. I bet that, that Hophni and Phinehas were saying, no, no, you, ha you have to. It's a duty of yours. I'm the priest, remember. And they, inc they were incredibly dishonoring to God. In fact, the Bible calls them scoundrels. The same words used several times in the Bible. One is uh, used as Moses describes people from different countries that come to the Israelites and try to get them to worship other gods. They're scoundrels. In the New Testament... I think, this is pretty amazing. The same word is used to describe Satan. And a most little, literal translation of scoundrels is sons without worth. That's Hophni and Phinehas. Sons without worth. They were anything but young men that were honoring God. In the fact, they were just the opposite and gave a, a terrible picture of respect and honor to God. And in verse 23... You've got Eli, the father, as he comes and he talks to his kids. He's stepping up, and he's uh, going to be responsible for them, and he's going to address them. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 23, here's the conversation. So Eli said to them, Why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. And as I read those words, the picture of God that I have, it, it doesn't jive with that, and I, and I have to think it through and process, how, what does this mean? Because the God I, I know is a God of love and grace, and yet I think through uh, what God is feeling and I can, I can understand why he would be angry with their disrespect. These feelings that he has, these two young punks disobeying and disrespecting the creator God of the universe. They're dishonoring their position, a sacred, holy position of a, a spiritual leader among the people. And they're putting themselves at enmity with God. They're taking themselves outside of his saving protection by choice. It's as if Hophni and Phinehas found themselves on the slippery slope of disobedience and sin and fell away from their calling as God lovers and priests and eventually found themselves at a place where they no longer made effort to honor God. And I think I could describe their, their decision-making responses in one phrase. When they, when they have a choice they have to make, when they have a decision they have to make, when they, they have a life uh, just uh, choice, I feel like their response, their default response turned into this right here. I don't care. I don't care. Quote, Hophni and Phinehas. You know, it's easy to slip into the realm of the I don't care. I mean, it's the easy way. <laughs> Got a tough decision? Uh, what should I do? I know the right thing to do. I know the wrong thing to do. Eh, I don't care. It, it's okay. You know, I don't care becomes the norm. Everyone else is doing it. I just don't care. How about this one? It's the default because it initially avoids guilt. Are you with me? This big decision that I have to make, does it honor God? Does it not honor God? If I don't care, then it doesn't matter. And if it doesn't matter, then I don't feel bad about it. I won't feel guilty about it. 
I don't care becomes an avoidance mechanism in us that pushes us away from making difficult decisions to honor God with our choices. And when we get into the state of I don't care, it's really easy to find ourselves living lives that don't honor God and are disrespectful to God Almighty. But you know what? When, when God sees people that uh, don't honor and don't respect him, uh, when he sees people that don't care, he finds someone that does care. And that's where Samuel enters this story. And I think it's amazing that Hannah and Elkanah, two parents, they bring their little boy, I don't know how old he was, maybe he's 12, maybe he's 7, maybe he's 4, I don't know. They bring him to this temple, uh, and they're, they're passing him over to Eli, the priest, who's an absentee father. How would you feel bringing your child to that? Even worse, how would you feel bringing your kid into the influences of these two scoundrels, these renegade priests that have no respect for God? Hannah and Elkanah must have had an immense trust in God Almighty to hand their boy over to Eli and his sons. But as a little boy, following every move of Eli, he learns the ways of honoring God. He learns what it means to stand for God amongst uh, rebellion. Even one night, you know the story, Samuel's laying there in bed, and he hears a noise, and he wonders, what's this noise? And he goes and he talks to Eli, and Eli figures it out. It's God talking to you. And God delivers this message to Samuel to give to Eli that Eli's ministry days are numbered. And as Samuel grows, he learns. And in verse 26, you've got it in your Bibles there, we see a verse that echoes in the New Testament as it talks about Jesus. It says this, And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. He grew to honor God. He grew to become the leader of the country. In fact, this little boy, Samuel, becomes the judge and the prophet of the country. He leads the whole country in a battle against the Philistines at Mizpah, and they win. There's this transition period in Israel where they say, we don't want just a judge, we want a king like everybody else. And so, uh, through God's uh, uh, direction, Samuel anoints the new king, Saul. And then again, he anoints David. And David, you know his line, brings Jesus to us. Samuel, this little boy that refused to fall into the I don't care mentality that always wanted to honor God no matter what. And God speaks to Eli, to Hophni, to Phinehas, to Samuel, and to you and me this morning as we close in on our key verse today, a verse that you know well, but now you know the context to it. It's 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. The very end uh, sentence in verse 30. Here's what it says. God speaking to you this morning. He says, He says, those who honor me, I will honor. Those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me will be dismayed. Disdain, excuse me. It's almost like God shows us, as he speaks, reciprocating honor. He says, if you honor me, I'll honor you. If you show me honor, I will show you honor. And when it comes to uh, honoring God, I think sometimes we need some specifics as we look at our own life. Because these specifics help you kind of analyze your own life and say, well, does the shoe fit for me? Or am I honoring God in these situations? And I've got a bunch of examples here. And you know what? None of these ideas um, will get you salvation. I don't care how good you are at honoring God. It's not going to get you salvation. You can't earn it. There's only one way to be saved, and that's to know Jesus and to continue to know him. But as you know him more, your life should change as you desire to honor him more. And so I look at these examples and uh, see if they help you stay away from the I don't care syndrome. There's a bunch. We're just going to cruise through them. You ready? Are you ready? Okay. Seven of you are ready. That's good. How about this? Honoring God with your body. Do you honor God with what you eat? I don't know. I mean, these hit home for me. Got healthy eating habits. I had some really good pie last night. I don't know if that's wrong, but do I honor him with what I eat? Do you get enough sleep at night? Do you exercise? Do you dress modestly, not showing what shouldn't be shown? Do you bring glory and honor to God through your body? How about this one? Honoring God with your finances. Do you return a faithful tithe to God? I mean, it's crazy to think that God owns everything in the whole universe, and yet he gives us some, and, and he says, show me honor by giving me 10% back. Uh, that's just the piece that honors him. Uh, do you go one step further with your thankfulness to him above and beyond and say, I'm going to give you an offering as well? 
How about this one? Are you honest with your taxes? How about this one? Do you pass along God's blessings to others in financial help? What about this? When you have excess money that you weren't counting on that shows up, what's your first thought? Is it, is it, is it I want to give selflessly to someone that needs it? Or is it uh, like happens to me so often? What can I buy for myself? Right? How about this one? Honoring God with our relationships. Do you show love and respect for your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend? Do you honor God by saving sex for marriage? Do you treat your neighbors in that relationship with love and care as if you are representing God? Are you transparent and honest with relationships so, so that God is honored with your honesty? Do you build relationships on social media that are uplifting and not demonizing? Do you honor God with your relationships? Here's another one. Uh, do you honor God with your media? When you watch TV, do you have honoring God in mind? I mean, that's a tough one. I'll be the first to admit that. Do you listen to music that honors him? Do you read books and magazines that bring him glory? Do you spend more time in the word than you do the world? Do you honor him with your Facebook and Instagrams and your Snapchat and your Twitter? And How about this one? Honoring God with your words. Do your words, do the words that you say bring glory to God? Do you tell the truth always? Do you build others up rather than tear them down? Do you have a foul mouth or one that speaks words to glorify the Savior? I mean, when we think about life, everything that we do brings glory to God or it brings disrespect to Him. And you know, one of my favorite verses that I often close sermons with, uh, because it's just, it's, it's this message over and over and over again. It's in Matthew chapter 5, 16. It's on the screen for you. It, su it, it summarizes this. It says, So let your light your life shine before men that they may see your good works, or I might say, they see your honor of God and praise your Father in heaven. Live in such a way that honors Him and people will know Him because of how you live. That's powerful to me. And I firmly believe that when you honor God with your life, He honors you back. You know, uh, I think it's, you're setting yourself up for failure if you ever look to a human, even if they're a pastor or a priest, to think that's the example of what honoring God looks like. Uh, so don't ever look to me like that. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I'm challenged by this just like you are. Uh, but there's, a, there's a, a recent incident that happened to me that is powerful that shows me how honoring God and he honors you back. And it happened in my life, and I'm going to share it with you this morning. Uh, it happened maybe uh, a year ago, not even a year. I've had my Toyota Tacoma, Tacoma uh, for just about a year, and it is a fantastic truck. Man, first truck I've ever had, and I don't think I'll ever not have a truck. Those things are awesome. Trucks have a bed, the only bed you don't have to make. You know what I mean? Yes, I love my truck, uh, but as soon as I got my truck, I quickly realized that there was one thing missing, and that was a trunk. Uh, it's got a bed, but you can't put things back there when it's raining, and if you park in a parking lot, you just got things exposed in the back of your truck, and so I thought, I need a tonneau cover. If you don't know what a tonneau cover is, it's a bed cover. They've got so many different kinds out there. They've got the hard uh, plastic caps that fit down over the top. They've got vinyl ones that can roll up. Um, they've got kinds that fold down. They've got any kind you want. And the kind I wanted was called, it's a name brand called Backflip. They're really nice. They're waterproof, um, and they can fold. Here, I'll show you a couple of pictures of them. <laughs> All right, so there's, there's two of them here, and they're different. And I got to, fellas, you're, you'll probably connect with this and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, ladies, if it's hard, you can do this. Here we go. There's two different kinds. You're looking at them. The top one is a bifold. How many is bi? Two. The bottom one is a trifold. How many is tri? Yeah, look at you guys. Um, the top one is great. They're, they're the same basic thing, and it folds once over itself and then up against the top of the, of the back of the cab. But it's super tall when it's up against the cab. The, tr the trifold folds three times, once over itself, and then again over, and then up against the cab, and you can see how it, it leans up against the cab, and you've got these kickstands on the bottom. See, here's the thing. The bifold, you can't drive with it open because it's too tall. The trifold, you can because it leans up, and you put the kickstands, you can drive on I-75, and it's no problem. Well, I decided that this is the kind that I really wanted, but the problem is they're $1,000 dollars. And I don't care who you are, a $1,000 accessory for your, uh, your Toyota Tacoma, I mean, that's going to be hard to get approval from the boss, if you know what I mean. 
So I got on Craigslist and started looking. Let's find this backflip. And I found one up in Rome, Georgia for $500. And I think that's a pretty good deal. And I said, I don't have $500 that I can just spend on this. And I had $250 of birthday money. And I said, this is great. So I offered, I said, hey, I'll give you $250. Brand new. And the lady said, sure, I'll take it. And I'm thinking, this is a great deal. Drove up, got it, put it on. It was perfect until I realized how, how much I needed a trifold. Because with the bifold, if you have anything that's tall, you can't drive down the road with it because you can't leave your, your, your tonneau cover open. And so I was frustrated at that, but it was nice to have it nonetheless. And I started searching on Craigslist for a trifold. I even put these little alarms on Craigslist that when, um, when, when one would come on there, it would get a little alert on my phone and I could look at it and see what it was. And they would come up all the time. But for Ford F-150s and GMCs and Chevy Silverados, but never my Toyota Tacoma. And sometimes it would be my Tacoma, but a six-foot bed, and I've got the short bed, a five-foot bed. These are details for you fellas that are like, yeah, I get this, yeah. Um, so, finally, on a Thursday evening, I got an alert on my phone. It said, Toyota Tacoma, trifold backflip, $300. And I'm thinking, this is the greatest thing ever. Norcross, Georgia, just across the way. I text the guy, hey, I'm ready to come pick that up. It was like 9.30 at night. I was like, I'll be there in an hour. Wait, are you still awake? Like, I want this thing. Let's get it. I'll pay you, I'll pay you $350 if I have to. I want this thing. And he said, well, you can't come get it tonight. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I can come get it tomorrow morning. And he said, well, I work all day Friday, um, so you can come and get it at 8 p.m. Friday night. My Sabbath starts when the sun goes down on Friday night. That's when my mind, I try to make it shift into spending time with Jesus or different time. Uh, I don't want to be cleaning the house. I, I really want to be just kind of a different mindset. And I think to myself, is buying something on Sabbath breaking the Sabbath? I don't know. Is uh, shopping for stuff on Craigslist bad on the Sabbath? I don't know. Does this honor God? As I'm processing this, I know the right answer. For me, it might not be the same for you. But as I'm thinking this through, I'm thinking, it's not the right thing to do for my Sabbath. And so I text him back and I say, hey, I can't come tonight, but I can come tomorrow night, uh, Saturday night after the sun goes down. And uh, he says, okay, great, we'll set it up. And so I'm there, on, so we go to church, everything, don't even think about it, you know, whatever. Saturday night, I text the guy, hey, I'm ready to come. Uh, tell me when and where. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, it got sold today. And I'm thinking of this verse that says, he who honors me, I will honor. I'm thinking, I honored you, God. What's your problem? <laughs> I'm, I'm dejected. I'm depressed. Still got a bifold. So I'm sitting on my couch, grab my phone, pull up Craigslist. I'm searching, searching, searching. I found another one. Up in Chattanooga, it's only $100. And I'm thinking, this is good. But it doesn't come with the mounting rails that go on your truck. And I think, well, I probably could buy those somewhere. I wonder how much those are. And I look online, I can't find a price anywhere easily. So I'm texting the guy, hey, tell me the story about yours. He said, oh, yeah, it's brand new. I haven't even taken it out of the box. Uh, it, I just decided I didn't want it. I've had it in my garage for over a year now. It's $100. Hey, I'll tell you what. Why don't you just make me an offer for it? And I'm thinking, this is great. Yes. And as I'm processing, what should I offer this guy? He comes back to me and he says, hey, let me make you an offer. How about it's free? And I'm thinking, what? Yeah. And I said, what? You know, what's the catch? Oh, no, just come up and get it. So on Monday morning, he leaves it in the box sitting in his driveway. He had to go to work. I drive up to Chattanooga. I had to open the box and stick my arm in to make sure there was something there. It's brand new. I put it in my truck, drive it home. I, I get online. I, t I talk to the, the ladies at Backflip, and I say, hey, how much are these parts? And she said, well, they're $300. And I say, that's okay. I was going to spend that anyway. I order the parts. They come. I get it all set up. I take pictures of my old tonneau cover, put it on Craigslist, and a 25-year-old dude with a five-foot-long Toyota Tacoma pulls into my driveway and gives me $340 for it. <laughs> Isn't that cool? So all said and done, I made $40 <laughs> and got the thing I really wanted. And I believe it's because I honored God. Because that verse tells me one thing. It says that when we honor God, he honors us back. 
I mean, that's a challenge in my life. And I hope it challenges you too. And may we strive to stay away from the I don't care mentality. But may we do our best to honor God in everything. Let's pray as we close. Heavenly Father, this morning I'm challenged uh, for pieces of my life that I know don't honor you. And so I ask that you'll, you'll urge me and challenge me. That you'll challenge all of us here too. That we can examine our lives and do our best to honor you. And God, we love you. And we can't wait to see you. In Jesus' name, amen.